Uh, well, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 10th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2022. Uh, the first item for committee members to consider is to agree or not to take agenda items 3, 4 and 5 in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. And the uh, main item on our agenda this morning is uh, consideration of the Auditor General for Scotland's report on the NHS in Scotland 2022. Um, which uh, was released, I think, exactly a month ago today. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, with us uh, in the committee room this morning uh, to give evidence on that report, the Auditor General, uh, Stephen Boyle, you're welcome. And uh, the Auditor General this morning is joined by the Executive Director of Audit Scotland, Anthony Clark. Very welcome, Anthony. And uh, Senior Manager at Audit Scotland, Lee Johnson and uh, Senior Auditor at Audit Scotland, uh, Fiona Lees. You are very welcome too. Uh, we have got uh, actually quite a large number of questions to put to you this morning because it was uh, quite an impactful report when it was uh, produced. Um, but before we get into those questions, Auditor General, can I ask you to make a short opening statement? Many thanks, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to bring to the committee this year's NHS in Scotland report. The report focuses on the Scottish Government's NHS recovery plan and it also looks at the progress to date against the ambitions in the, pl in the plan and examines the challenging operating environment and the impact that is having on progress to delivery of the plan. The NHS continues to be affected by the impact of COVID-19 and a growing range of financial and operational challenges are making progress with recovery extremely difficult. NHS finances remain under severe pressure in spite of growing health spending, rising inflation, increasing recurring pay pressures and ongoing COVID-19 related costs cast doubt on the financial sustainability of health services. Both the legacy of COVID-19 and a challenging winter period are affecting how the NHS operates. The flow of patients through hospitals continues to be impacted by issues in the social care sector leading to pressures throughout the healthcare system. The backlog of care that built up during the pandemic continues to grow, and the health and wellbeing of people waiting for treatment is being negatively impacted by longer waiting times. The Scottish Government's NHS recovery plan was intended to tackle the backlog of care and drive forward innovation and reform to make services more sustainable. But it lacks detailed actions that would allow overall progress to be accurately measured. It's already clear, though, that delays to opening some of the series of new national treatment centres will mean targets for increasing planned care activity will be missed. Some key recruitment targets with the recovery plan are not currently on track. Some are, but that risks successful achievement of the recovery ambitions. Convener reform is essential if NHS services are to be delivered sustainably in the long term. Urgent action is needed on tackling the long-term demand for NHS services by improving people's health and reducing health inequalities. There is some progress in innovation and reform, which is welcome, but this is at an early stage and its longer-term impact is not yet known. It is vital that the Scottish Government presses ahead with these in, in these areas and monitors progress carefully to ensure that innovation and reform is having a positive impact. It must also make sure that there is clear communication with the public on how these services may change in the future. Lastly, the report highlights the need for greater transparency on progress against the Scottish Government's recovery ambitions and on clearing the backlog of care. The Scottish Government must make better use of its annual progress updates on reporting against the recovery plan to provide an accurate and comprehensive summary of progress. Convener, as ever, my colleagues and I look forward to answering the committee's questions as best we're able to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And without further ado, I'd like to begin uh, that questioning by inviting the Deputy Convener, Sharon Dowie, to uh, open up. Sharon. Good morning. Um, the report highlights significant challenges facing the NHS in Scotland, while noting that healthcare systems are under extreme pressure across the world. How is the NHS in Scotland performing compared to other countries' healthcare systems? Well, I say right from um, the outset, this report doesn't look to draw that comparison, Deputy Convener, in terms of the Scottish NHS relative to healthcare systems 
um, across the world. I'll bring in uh, colleagues in a moment. Maybe uh, Lee might want to um, elaborate. What we look to do in, in today's report is to update on the progress against the Scottish Government's own recovery plan that it produced in 2021. And our general message from that is that it's proving extremely challenging to deliver all of the ambitions. Before passing to leave, I think the one thing I would say is that the Government has been clear in its communication of the extent of pressure that NHS in Scotland is facing. I think we all saw over the winter period with the, the scale of winter pressures and heard from the Government that it's, it's extremely, an extremely pressurised challenge system in Scotland at the moment. There are some international dynamics to our, to our report today that we do reference uh, the reach that the government is looking to have in the NHS in terms of broadening its international recruitment. But the report itself doesn't look to draw an evidence-based comparison between the Scottish NHS system and other systems elsewhere. Lee may wish to elaborate uh, upon that. Uh, I, I don't have much to add, as the Auditor General has said. We, we are not trying to draw comparisons in this report. Um, but I, all I would um, acknowledge is that we know from other audit agencies across the UK, for example, um, that the, the other healthcare systems are facing the same issues in terms of uh, growing backlogs of patients that need to be seen and the challenges that they're facing in trying to address that backlog in care. Thank you. Um, the report also states that COVID-19 spend will no longer be monitored. Given your call for transparency and recovery progress, is it premature for the Scottish Government to stop monitoring this spending? I think, as we've discussed in, in some of our uh, recent reporting um, and updated the committee on that, um, there is there is now no separate COVID-19 um, budget line in the in the Scottish budget um, for. The committee's awareness, um, I think one, we committed to uh, rounding off our COVID-19 reporting and, and we'll be doing that shortly with a, a web-based publication that just sets out the totality of COVID-19 identified spending um, relative to uh, actual spending. That's due uh, to be published uh, relatively soon. But in terms of the transparency point you make, I think, if I may, I say that that relates, yes, to COVID-19 spending. But as a wider point, firstly, on COVID-19, as we, I said in my introductory remarks, Deputy Convener, that COVID-19 still has a, a significant impact, both operationally on um, the Scottish NHS, but also the financial implications of it. Um, and maybe just draw the, the committee's attention to uh, appendix, if I get this right, my notes. Appendix 2 to the report sets out some of the in year forecast that NHS boards in Scotland are making. And you can see from that table that there are still very significant financial challenges. Um, transparency matters, whether it relates to COVID-19 expenditure or to the wider performance and financial position of NHS boards. But ultimately, it's within the gift of the NHS and the Scottish Government as to whether they are continued to identify COVID-related expenditure. I think the indications that we've had is that that will cease to be the case um, and there, there won't be a separately identified budget for it. It doesn't detract from the overall need for transparency, nonetheless. Okay. What's your assessment of the progress of the Scottish Government's COVID cost improvement programme? I'll, I'll bring colleagues in um, in a moment. Lee might want to, uh, to, to update the committee um, on that point. The, the overall position of COVID has dominated the... Um, the services of the NHS in Scotland for the past few years. We are looking now to see um, the, the delivery of a recovery plan and a clear plan that relates to um, both the lingering effects of COVID-19, but moving to a position of stability that captures both transformation in the, sh in the longer term and clear, transparent performance in the short term. Lee may wish to say a bit more about COVID-19 issues. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, the uh, COVID cost improvement programme, we know that it, it, there has been reductions made. Um, it, for example, COVID costs uh, for this year uh, are predicted to be about £723 million, um, But we know that is a reduction from earlier estimates. Uh, boards have been working hard to try and uh, reduce the costs related to COVID. So that's things like PPE, uh, the vaccinations, tests and protect, as well as uh, various uh, you know, infection 
um, prevention and control measures. Um, so each board was given a, a funding envelope uh, to cover their COVID costs, and they've worked very hard to try and keep their costs within that funding envelope going forward. Right. And will all health boards be following the same guidelines? I'm just thinking that if we're not monitoring the spending, do we run the risk of some health boards spending a lot more in COVID? Than, than others, or indeed some maybe not spending enough on measures? I, I think it, the, the spend will vary across boards. Um, I think they are monitoring it this year, obviously, because they have that funding envelope. I think what, what we're talking about is going forward into the following year. The, the, the hope is that COVID costs, it, it becomes part of the core uh, funding and core operation, um, it, it, it won't be separated as, as being COVID related anymore. So as I've said, things like the uh, infection prevention and control measures that are required, PP, that kind of thing um, ongoing will just be, become core costs. There are no addition, you know, there is now no additional money uh, from the UK government to cover our COVID costs, so it just has to become part of the ongoing health and social care budget. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Can, can we Cross, yes, please. Come thank back you. In. Uh, I think Anthony wanted to come in on this point as well. Just to make a, the point that uh, this is an area of interest to us because it's part of the efficiency drive across the NHS in Scotland. So we are, through Lee and others, looking to see how effective this recovery programme, this, this efficiency programme is, because there might be lessons the NHS can learn in other ways of identifying and sharing good practice. I think your question, Sharon, implies, is there, is there learning and good practice being identified and shared across the boards? I think our sense is that the, the governance around this is trying to, trying to do that. Thanks. Uh, Willie Coffey wanted also to come in on this question. Willie. Thanks, Convener. Just briefly on that point, Auditor General, the table you show in Exhibit 1 shows £723 million of COVID spend. And then the next column for 2023-24 says... It's not yet known. Do you mean by that we, you anticipate that that level of funding will still be required to support COVID initiatives from the Scottish Government, but we just don't know the figure? It's not that that money will be lost. Do you anticipate that that will still be required? Yeah, I think there's a number of factors uh, to, to expand upon, Mr Coffey. I think the, the money won't be lost. So but I think it's the extent to which the NHS in Scotland, the Scottish Government, wishes to separately monitor and report on COVID-related activity. I think we can all assume that the, the size of COVID spend will ebb further as, um, it, from, from the peak where we were you know, a couple of years ago. Obviously, today marks the third anniversary um, of that. But we can safely um, assume that there still will be some COVID-related expenditure. Lee rightly mentions that there are infection control measures that are required. Uh, within uh, hospitals for COVID-related patients. What it won't be is of the scale that we've seen previously. So we don't have a figure. Um, I would say there would be no harm in the NHS in Scotland continuing to monitor uh, the scale of expenditure, um, but we can assume that it will be lower than it has been up until now. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the, I reflect that the terms of debate in this Parliament on the NHS, which is um, a very high uh, priority for, uh, for all of us, um, is often a contrast between inputs and outcomes. And I note that in your report you uh, uh, note that there has been a £4.4 billion increase in NHS spending since 2018-19. Uh, and that the budget for 2023 to 24 is estimated to be over £19 billion. And I think you assess that as being uh, three years earlier a level of expenditure than anticipated. So there is no question but that there is substantial public investment uh, going into the uh, NHS, uh, but yet we don't see outcomes uh, necessarily improving. So I think the there's a rather fundamental question in here, isn't there, which is about um, is it just funding that we need uh, or are there other uh, factors that are necessary to uh, be applied in order to rise to the challenges that we are facing in the National Health Service? Yeah, that's, a, it's a, that's the nub of the vital issue here, convener. Um, the committee may have seen publication over the past day or so of the Scottish Fiscal Commission's report that looked at you know, really casting you know eye over the next five decades of what public spending in Scotland might look like, and that report suggests that there will be you know, a ten percent drift 
of income and expenditure. And that's largely attributed to the increase in the rate of health spending in Scotland, which suggests an unsustainable model if we continue at that rate. And Anthony will want to come in and talk about this, I think, about some of the what the, the key in, to unlock some of the change. You know, and I don't wish to glibly talk about reform, but unless we move to a preventative model that tackles health challenges, encourages people to live healthier lives, then we don't have a sustainable health system in Scotland. That is the the real onus upon leaders to, to make that kind of change. There are some very good examples in today's report, I would say, about kind of where um, some of those innovation and reform is happening, scaling those up to make the, the significant change to improve the health of the people of Scotland. It's so important to deliver you know, better health for, for all of us that we want, but also a fiscally sustainable approach at the same time. Anthony. You're quite right, convener. The, the issue here in many ways is about the burden of ill health that Scotland faces and the long-standing issues which we're all aware of, of the inequality of health outcomes across Scotland. Um, the way the Scottish Government has tried to organise its care and wellbeing portfolio, I think recognises and acknowledges the importance of focusing on prevention, working with partners to make sure that we can, if you like, change people's behaviour and, and work on the, the kind of determinants of ill health around things like employment, housing and wellbeing. So this is a really big issue for the Scottish Government that they've recognised. Uh, exhibit 12 of the report, I think, sets out some of the things that, that the Scottish Government is trying to do to drive this reform. So it's about coherence across government, getting different bits of government to work better together. It's about being clear about what a sustainable model for the health service looks like. And as the Auditor General says, that has to be about reforming and changing how health is delivered. But it's also about what we do as individuals as well. So that focus on public health interventions, that focus on changing people's behaviours is really, really important. I think the report indicates that it's still relatively early days for that. We reported on this in the last overview. You can expect this to have a much greater prominence in our future NHS reporting because we're very keen to explore and report on how effectively the health department, the care and wellbeing portfolio, is working with others to make that shift. This is really important stuff if we're going to have a sustainable health service. Thanks. I mean, and I, th I think those broader questions are ones that we've touched on before, uh, are around inequality and poverty, and those are often the drivers of uh, the demands that are placed on the National Health Service. So it's a broader public health question and a societal question, uh, which we probably haven't got time to go into this morning, but, but is, 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 I think, an important thread that runs through this. Uh, can I uh, now uh, apply the handbrake and jump onto something else which is related but quite different and that is in the report you talk about the um, capital backlog maintenance budget and uh, which I know has been something that's been the focus of attention in in previous years and I think there's again there's a long-standing critique isn't there about um, uh, why should it be backlog maintenance rather than proactive maintenance and if maintenance is carried out um, on an ongoing basis it becomes less reactive and probably more cost-effective but again, that might be another um, uh, argument debate for us to have. But I suppose the, the question for this morning uh, I, I want to put to you is, in the report you indicate uh, that it's proposed to double investment in the uh, capital backlog maintenance budget over the next five years. I mean, given all the other pressures on spending in the National Health Service, how confident are you that that is going to be an achievable goal? So you're right, the, the report does set out that that is the Scottish Government's intention to um, double its investment in maintenance, backlog maintenance, other maintenance over the course of over the next five years. Um, for the committee's attention, we, we also reference in, in that same paragraph in a report from 2020 on NHS capital maintenance backlog. At the time, this figure stood over a billion pounds. So, I mean, stepping back for a second, uh, these are the about you know, health and safety and appropriate conditions that people who work in the NHS and those who are receiving treatment. Um, of course, we have to invest in our estate to maintain the standards, not just in the, the new bills. Of, you know, the committee, I'm sure, will be interested in the national treatment centres that are part of the key strand to deliver additional capacity in the NHS to address the, the recovery ambitions. But at the same time, it's just as important to maintain the quality of the existing estate you asked me directly, convener, how confident I am. Um, I think we have to continue to track and monitor that. It's vital that it's done, and it's done consistently. There is temptation across, particularly when times are fiscally challenging, 
to defer maintenance arrangements, not just in the NHS, but really across organisations, that has to be avoided because ultimately all that's doing is deferring uh, health and safety and, it's to, and it will lead to larger investment requirements at a later date. Um, we'll keep an eye on that through our, our programme of work over the next few years. Thanks. And I mean, presumably you will also keep an eye on that as it um, uh, fits with net zero targets and that whole agenda of um, uh, the public sector estate and how it needs to be uh, changed quite substantially in order to meet those ambitious goals that we've got on uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions. Um, yeah, very much so, Convener. Actually, um, with uh, the committee's agreement, we'll be updating you in more detail next week on our uh, future work programme that covers our intentions around net zero, but also the public sector estate. And just by, with some additional context around that, the, the use of assets... Um, by the Scottish Government as bodies and the wider public sector in Scotland was a key plank of the resource spending review from last year that sets out that actually you know, how we are using assets you know, is, a, is a key driver for fiscal sustainability, the experience that people have of public services and public sector reform. Um, we want to be part of that through our auditing work. I can say further uh, as you wish, if that's convenient next week. Yeah, we will return to that next week and uh, beyond. Uh, thanks for that. I'm going to bring uh, Craig Hoy in, who's got questions on uh, one of those other uh, uh, important uh, topics for us as a parliament at the moment. Thank Craig. you. Uh, Convener. Good morning, Mr Boyle, and uh, good morning to your colleagues. Um, obviously, you have um, said in the past to this committee that in relation to the National Care Service, which is a huge uh, piece uh, of public policy work, you weren't going to wait until it was created before you started to audit and analyse uh, particularly the numbers around it. And in the report, um, you warned that the National Care Service will place a huge strain on the health and social care budget. Obviously, concerns have been uh, raised within this Parliament, particularly by the Finance Committee, in relation to the financial memorandum that associates, uh, that, that, that accompanies uh, the, the bill. Um, that legislation is, in, on, is on pause now. What's your understanding as to why the legislation has been paused? Is it to look further at, at, at the numbers, do you believe? Yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll bring Anthony in a moment, actually. Can, he's been uh, closely monitoring this and can say a bit more. Um, Audit Scotland, like many organisations, responded to the Finance and Public Administration's committee's call for evidence. And we commented on the financial memorandum, the extent to which there were potentially some significant risks of additional costs that hadn't been specifically identified in the financial memorandum that might come to fruition and um, ought to be considered in coming to a, a perhaps a more rounded assessment of likely future costs. Um, we also um, have a history, uh, Mr Hoy, of undertaking audit work um, alongside the implementation of significant changes in delivery models or policy. Social Security Scotland um, is perhaps the, the most recent example where Audit Scotland has undertaken a programme of public audit reporting whilst an initiative was being developed. A rationale for that um, has evolved over the course of, say, the past 10 years. Um, that you know, historically, an audit organisation would have been entirely retrospective. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we reached, the point, well, actually, given that there's so much um, public investment at stake and such key outcomes for the people of Scotland, actually, we felt that there was a, a role for us um, at a slightly earlier stage. We think that's there's an appropriate parallel with the National Care Service too. Anthony can come on, if he wishes, just say about the kind of pr programme of work that we're thinking about that. OK. Um, a bit kind of where that goes next. Anthony. Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr Hoyer. I think our understanding is that the pause is so that the Scottish Government can reflect on the various views that have been expressed around the merits or demerits of the proposals that have been put forward hitherto. Um, I think the sense is that there's broad acceptance that the issues highlighted by Feely around the need for greater consistency, yeah. better support for workforce, better user involvement are all desirable, but may, there may be different ways of achieving those outcomes. So I think that's the, my understanding of the rationale for the pause at the moment. In respect of our work in this area, we, we were very clear, I think, in our submission to the, to the Parliament on the NCS consultation that the issues that face the social care system around sustainability, quality, consistency, workforce support need to be addressed now. We can't wait for a national care service yes. to achieve them. So we're planning to do a suite of work focusing on particular themes and topics, looking at the issues that we highlighted in our briefing paper. Alongside that, 
um, the Auditor General's colleagues at the Accounts Commission will be reporting annually on the financial health of integration joint boards, and that reporting is likely to expand to cover performance and outcomes over time in the period running up to the National Care Service. And as the Auditor General has already said, if the decision is made to, to proceed with the National Care Service, we will want to audit the planning for that implementation, the effectiveness of the implementation, and in the longer term, whether or not the changes that are put in place do deliver the policy objectives of better outcomes, better value for money, and a more sustainable, high-quality service. So this is a really important area of interest for us. Thanks. Obviously, uh, the report highlights that the uh, National Care Service, if it proceeded, would be, and I think the quotes are, a significant unknown financial commitment to be met from the Scottish Government's health and, and social care budget. To what extent are you concerned uh, about the Scottish Government's ability to meet its spending commitments in relation to the NCS and the, and the impact that this may have right throughout the, the healthcare system in Scotland? Uh, maybe two things to, to, to say in response to your question, Mr Hoy. I think the Scottish Government, the Scottish Government has to set a balanced budget every year. So, really, so, so when the Parliament considers the budget bill, um, it will prioritise. And you know, so there will be spending commitments will be met, but it will come down to prioritisation of health and social care services relative to other parts of Scottish Government uh, delivery. And I think it is of such relevance to the, the convener's earlier point and the Fiscal Commission's reporting that actually um, reform of health and social care is so important. So it's not a detraction from us about the merits or demerits of no. the National Care Service, no. but actually the, the government uh, and its partners are absolutely clear on what the intended outcomes are to be from a National Care Service. That there's transparency, of course, and that's known and understood relative to other priorities. That's really where we're coming at it from an audit perspective. Yeah. Exhibit two of the report um, highlights the quite considerable uh, increase in delayed discharge. Obviously, uh, Mr Clark, you identified that action needs to be taken now to remedy some of the issues because the whole issue about flow through the health service is in part down to, in large part, down to delayed discharge, which comes down to capacity within the social care system. The government has announced plans uh, to purchase 600 interim uh, care beds with a 25% uh, uplift in the, the national care home contract uh, rate. Um, have you made any calculation of how sustainable and how effective this uh, this intervention, short term, relatively short term intervention, might be, and, and is it going to deliver value for money? In in, in your view, I, I think it's premature to make that, that detailed assessment. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring Fiona in a moment, actually, who's uh, looked at this as part of our reporting. Um, delayed discharges are a key part of the challenge here. You know, is that we've um, seen and you know through our work and, and have reported actually that having an effective whole system approach from the delivery of hospital-based services through to community-based services and the interconnections between those are absolutely vital. We know and we've seen over the course of the pandemic um, and currently experiencing that's not all working as was before the pandemic and that's causing delays in a hospital-based setting and some of the challenges to deliver um, health and social care. On the interim arrangements, um, we, I think they're exactly that. They were designed to relieve some of the short-term pressures that were experienced as a result of winter pressures. What we call for in, in today's report is that there's a comprehensive plan around delayed discharges that involve both the NHS and their social care partners to move to a sustainable you know, care-based model. I'm going to pause and, and Fiona can come in and say a bit more as she wishes. Um, I don't think I've really too much more to add than what the Auditor General has already said. I think it's really too early to say. Mm -hmm. um, what impact that's had. We have seen a slight decline in the number of delayed discharges since yeah. that peak um, yeah. in November, so it's going in the right direction, but I think we need to, a bit more time to see what's going to happen. And as the Auditor General said, the real thing is to have a long-term strategy um, that's going to solve the problem in the long term. Thanks. The, the National Care Service envisages a significant role for the, the private sector, potentially some have argued a, a greater role for the private sector if local authorities step back from that. Looking at the true cost of care seems to be quite a fundamental issue at the heart of this, because even with that uplift, uh, I, I looked at some numbers, and so you know the £832 a week is the national care home contract rate, 25% increase takes you up to about 1040 Speaking to private sector care home, care home providers, who this scheme is meant to incentivise to free up capacity for delayed discharge, they're still arguing that that falls short of what they would perceive to be the true cost of care, given they're competing with uh, or are contending with, you know, cost of living crisis, higher energy bills, uh, staffing cost pressures. So is part of the problem here that until we identify the true cost of care 
uh, and, and, and therefore properly uh, um, fund care, uh, particularly those who are, being, who are, who are not self-funding, and remove this element of cross-subsidy that we're never really going to get the capacity that will allow us to bring down quite aggressively those delayed discharge figures. I think that's the essence of the challenge. Anthony can come in and see more. He's looked at some of this, but really, that you know, through the consultation from uh, the committee, now the pausing of arrangements is really to have for all partners designed to take forward the national care service are clear that this is a sustainable approach to yeah. delivery. Because, um, as Anthony rightly mentions, and from our reporting and the committee's interest in this over the past eighteen months or so, is that there, there is a an extremely challenging situation right now that, that can't wait for a, a national care service down the line. There has to be both a, a short-term plan, a medium-term, then a longer-term vision of the delivery of, of health and social care services um, in Scotland. So much of that relies on the partnership, both with Scottish Government, local authorities and private sector providers to get it right to moving to that sustainable approach. Mr Roy, Anthony can say a bit more as he wishes. I, th I think you're right, Mr Hoy. There is a very interesting question here around cross subsidisation and transparency of costs. And I think part of the work that needs to take place as the development of the National Care Service is what is the nature of the market we're operating in yeah. here? And, and what market mechanisms are going to be effective and appropriate to deliver high quality care that delivers the right outcomes, but also protects the public purse and delivers efficiency? And at the moment, it feels as though those questions are a bit unresolved. Yeah. Obviously, we understand that social care and um, the, uh, the NHS uh, are inextricably linked um, and your report states that the Scottish Government's NHS recovery plan was not informed by detail and robust modelling nor were NHS boards involved in setting the ambitions of the plan. It further states that the Scottish Government is currently undertaking an exercise to model capacity across the whole health system. To what extent are NHS boards involved in this current modelling process and should it also include uh, all elements of the social care sector to ensure that we have the capacity there for that displacement? Yeah, I'll, I'll turn to Lee in a second. He's done quite a lot of work looking at the, I suppose, the construction and then the delivery of, of the uh, NHS recovery plan. Well, first, I think, first of all, what we say in our report is it's quite a high level document when it was conceived um, at the height of the pandemic. And there is some element of mitigation to this, Mr Hoy, that this was done in, in 2021 and you know, we recall what conditions were like at that stage. Um, but it wasn't done on the basis of robust modelling, nor did it widely consult with um, NHS boards. Through our report today, we have um, engaged with a number of NHS boards as part of our approach case study boards, just to kind of test some of the experiences that they've had. Um, we, we do say a high level, and before passing to Lee, is that not necessarily need an, and it just needs a, a new plan, but it needs to report really clearly mm. annually on the progress that it's making, informed by more detailed um, modelling, as you suggest. Lee. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, in terms of uh, the modelling, um, I think how involved boards have been in that would be a question for the Scottish Government. We are aware that they are working on it and we, as we clearly say in our report, we think that this should be pro progressed as quickly as possible. Um, it has been ongoing for a number of months now um, and we've still seen no evidence of, of, of what, what's to come or, or what's you know the result of that modelling. So we think it's very important that they do progress that very quickly. But I think in terms of how involved the boards have been in that modelling would be a question for Scottish Government. In terms of outcomes, the first um, annual progress report was in October 2022. And the first milestones of uh, increased activity are in fall into 2023. If you were creating a dashboard now of those milestones of increased activity, is it fair to say that they're still flashing red or um, and do we need greater transparency around them, given that obviously that progress and recovery was meant to come to fruition this year? I think there are lots of flashing red lights. So, you know, we, are, we see that um, activity is still below pre-pandemic levels, yet the recovery plan had promised to um, increase the number of procedures um, and, the, and you know, the, the amount of activity. Um, obviously, the NTCs, the, the National Treatment yeah. Centres, are key to that, um, but there has been some delays to those for, for various reasons. Uh, so hopefully, once the National Treatment Centres uh, come online, then we might start to see some progress in that area. But yes, I, I think there has not been the increase in activity that we would like to have seen by this point. 
and when we get the 2023 report, would it would it be uh, prudent for us to be pressing for greater transparency uh, and more detail around what what is actually being achieved? I think the answer to that is yes. That uh, a clear progress report against all the intended milestones yeah. and all that were set out in, in the progress report. Governments can change tack. You know, if the, if, there needs, if the government intends to produce a new recovery plan, um, that's entirely within their gift. But what, what our report suggests is, based on the current extant report, is that clear progress should be reported against all of the milestones within that. Um, and the version that was produced last year um, didn't cover all of the the targets that were set out in the recovery plan. Um, as we set out in, in Appendix 3 to the report, you know, what we try to do is give a, a fairly detailed analysis. And you can see that you know, there are progress against some of the measures in it. Um, and the committee may wish to come on to explore this further. But what we have drawn attention to in today's report, particularly around the progress against waiting times backlog, yeah. is that that felt a bit general. So that, you know, and... People care most deeply about the specialism treatment they are waiting for. And if that's not set out in the report, the report can be less helpful, less relevant to them. So what it suggested is that that's clear and comprehensive for all parts of the way that people use the NHS. Thanks very much. Thanks. I think Willie Coffey wanted to come in on a point around this uh, whole area of questioning as well. Willie. Thanks again, <coughs> Convener Auditor General. Is this on the, the process of discharge? Uh, I was speaking with the Chief Exec at Ayrshire and Health Board recently who identified an issue that it's consultants, it's only consultants that can discharge a person from hospital. And to be honest, I didn't realise that, convener. But she was telling me that there is wider expertise within the profession that could discharge people from hospital. And I wanted to pick up whether, with you whether you're aware of that. And would that, if we can address that particular issue, could that help the process of discharge? Because we can understand, convener, that people could be in hospital capable of being discharged eh, who aren't being because consultants aren't getting to them in time to discharge them. Is that an issue you're familiar with? Yeah, I've been uh, Fiona, actually, who's looked at um, discharge arrangements more closely than I and I have, Mr Coffey, and the familiarity of it. What I would say, but I think, uh, first of all, is that... that you know, respecting the professional judgment of clinicians, but I know we have seen you know evolving models within health and social care settings that are less reliant upon medical staff and bring in the expertise of different specialisms. In terms of how that's applied across delayed discharge settings, Fiona can say a bit more if she can. If not, we can come back to you in writing. Okay, it wasn't, that wasn't something that specifically came up when we talked to each of our case study boards, but it's certainly a really interesting question. Um, I know that work has been done, obviously, to improve the process of um, dis, um, discharging patients, but the particular question you asked is not one that came up, and I think it's worth us asking in the future. Mm -hmm. that, uh, as colleagues have said, we haven't explored this in great detail, but it seems to me there are some quite important issues here around recognising the importance of the medical duty of care to make sure that people can be safely discharged and it's appropriate for them to leave the hospital setting. My understanding is that it isn't just me medics and consultants that are involved in those discussions. Often you'll have occupational therapists, clinical nursing staff and others mm -hmm. involved. And I think the evidence in the report and our analysis of the broader systems problems would indicate that the problem here is probably less to do with the ability of consultants to make those decisions, more to do with the availability of support in the community to allow people to be discharged quickly. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting point that was made, Convener, because she also said that you know junior doctors, many of whom have 20 years plus experience, are just as capable of, of making the discharge decision for a patient than, than a consultant. So it's perhaps something we could follow up at a future date, Convener. Thank you. Yep, um, absolutely. I'm sure that we, we will return to that point. Um, can I just move things along a bit and, um, and turn to something which has uh, been of interest to this committee, not only in this session, but in the previous session, and that is the financial position of individual territorial health boards. And I think in the report you suggest that uh, in your assessment uh, of the 14 territorial health boards, only three are expected to break even. Uh, which means 11 are not, and I presume that doesn't mean they're going to make a surplus. I presume that means there's a financial deficit which they are facing. And so, um, uh, the, 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 and we know that in the past, 
uh, that has led you to have to produce Section 22 reports about health board conduct uh, because people have been, uh, uh, well, have chosen to go down routes which have uh, raised uh, some concerns about uh, where they have gone to get additional resources. I guess the question that um, the committee's got today for you is how fit for purpose are the brokerage arrangements? I think the so this term brokerage is about uh, an intervention, isn't it, by uh, the Scottish Government to help out um, individual health boards. And I think at, at one point it was based on a, was it a one-year time horizon now, it, then it went to three. Could you just bring us up to date on what the current position is and whether, in your estimation, you think those arrangements are going to be robust enough to get those health boards through the challenges that they face? Thank you, convener. Yes, I alluded to it earlier, actually, but just to bring the committee's attention back to, I think, the heart of your question. Appendix 2 to today's report sets out the year-end forecasts that both the territorial and the national um, NHS boards in Scotland are making uh, for the end of 2022-23. And you rightly say only three uh, of the territorial boards are forecasting that they will achieve at least a break-even position um, um, currently. Um, I think it's probably reasonable to assume that the position won't be as bad as that um, at the year end. And I think there's, a, there's an interesting example elsewhere in the report that one of our case study boards um, received additional funding when it identified to the Scottish Government that it had a cost pressure. So circumstances can be quite volatile. New money can be found, uh, either uh, from funding arrangements from government or savings identified by the board themselves. That has tended to be the way of things. So rather than looking at the appendix as it is currently, that will be the case by the end of the year. Um, that doesn't detract, though, convener, that there is a real financial pressure within the system currently. The report refers to um, inflationary pressures um, for goods and services, for, um, for pay arrangements. All of these are driving costs up in the NHS, and we've, we've touched already this morning that the legacy of COVID hasn't yet been resolved. That's still reducing inefficiency. All of these factors are relevant. What we've said in, in the report, though, is a recommendation that, you know, whether it's brokerage or otherwise, is that the Scottish Government needs to review the medium-term financial framework that it has in place for the health system in Scotland. What that looks like, its forecasts, to allow it to financially plan into the medium term with more detail. It's got a clearer understanding of the resources at its disposal. Whether that means it plans to take, make any revision to the, the brokerage arrangements to change to any of the funding environment, effectively that's a matter for government. What we're saying is that the current model needs a revision. Can I, can, can I just clarify, and this is probably my... Uh, um, ignorance, really. But on the one hand, you talked and I asked a question about uh, the increase in resources, an additional four billion over the last um, uh, five years or six years. Um, but then at the same time, the narrative in paragraph 24 of the report is about how health boards have to make savings. So ha can you reconcile that for me? On the one hand, there is this, uh, you know, record level 19 billion pounds of public money going into the National Health Service. This is not and a broader categorization of public health this into the National Health Service, this amount is going. And yet, at the same time, there is a call on both uh, national NHS boards and territorial NHS boards to make savings. Yes, yeah, so, so, so those th two things do feel contradictory, but yet they are both true at the same time. So funding is at record levels. Um, funding is always at record levels, I should say, though, convener, actually, you know, the, the, the nature of the growth of public spending is that um, for, in the context of the NHS, it will continue to grow based on the projections that we've seen from the um, resource spending review, the government's uh, own forecasts. And yet, how far that spending goes is being constrained by you know, cost of living pressures, inflationary pressures, purchasing food f for hospitals, cost of medicines, uh, dressings and so forth, and pay pressures. All of those are eating into the extended capacity that the up to over £19 billion um, is offering. And that leads to you know, the requirement, really the kind of well-trodden path that you know, this committee and predecessor committees have heard of, the need for boards to make savings. Where we get to, though, is that 
I, I fear that we'll always be in this position. You know, there'll be a growth in public spending and there'll be a requirement for boards to make savings unless it's underpinned by a wider examination of the sustainability of the health model that captures how we can lead, exactly as Anthony said, healthier lives as a population, have a preventative model and one that's less focused on interventions at a later, more expensive stage. Thank you. That's uh, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, and and developing that theme a little bit um, is the whole question of innovation. And it, I guess it comes back to uh, it's not just about the money; it's how we do things. And you cite in the report um, a couple of examples of um, uh, innovation. Um, uh, one is a bit more long-standing and structural, which is the um, NHS 24 system, uh, which has been, I think. Uh, reviewed and, and reformed. But I want to start by asking you about the case study that uh, you uh, put in the report, which is the Scottish Ambulance Service um, uh, uh, intervention, uh, where they, I think you describe it as they've established an integrated clinical hub, which is uh, to introduce a, a level of, I think, clinical judgment to determine whether or not, uh, where there are calls for ambulances to attend uh, there is in fact uh, a reasonable uh, demand being placed upon the service or not um, and I think um, the finding that you uh, uh, came up with or the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, supplied to you uh, was that when there were those interventions it was discovered that 50, up to 50% of those calls uh, did not require a 999 ambulance. Um, so I just wonder whether uh, you could reflect on that and uh, you know, perhaps enlighten us uh, to the extent that you're in a position to about whether if that was the result, a 50% reduction in the requirement for 999 ambulances uh, based on a kind of 15% intervention, if there was a, a, a greater level of intervention, if more of those calls were screened or this clinical uh, judgment was applied to them, would that then lead to the same kind of results right across the entire service? Yeah, I'm going to bring colleagues in, actually, who have looked at this closely. I think, firstly, uh, Fiona, I can come in, in a second, but it's that, at a, a strategic level, it's these types of test of change and innovations that are so crucial to change the model of health services. Um, patients behave rationally, convener, as we know, so, you know, and if they think that they're, they're unwell, they will phone 999, but it's so the steps that the Scottish Ambulance Service are taking are really important. Early signs are very successful too. It's the expansion of that approach across Scotland with the thorough evaluation really matters and builds upon these approaches across other aspects of healthcare too. Fiona can start actually and others can jump in um, as she wishes. Yeah, we had a good conversation with SAS about this particular project and as you say so of the 15% of cases where um, um, the advanced um, practice clinicians consult with patients, they are able to, half of those are able to stop a 999 ambulance having to go out, so that is, that's a really positive development. Um, SAS have done a lot of work um, over the last year in um, managing demand and capacity, so a lot of that is about trying to prevent patients who don't need to go to hospital from going to hospital, so it's about finding the most appropriate care pathway for them and sometimes that's it, that's within the community so um this work's still ongoing but yeah the first early steps early signs are that it's been a really positive um step in that direction um they also said that um they're doing a lot of work with um boards and um local authorities to talk about this approach and how it can be best applied within um local areas so that it's not just happening through SAS, there's so there, um, the flow navigation centres that are part of the redesign of urgent care are all designed to help prevent um, patients going to hospital when it's not necessary and find the most appropriate pathway of care for them in the community. So is, is this clinical hub, is this a pilot and is it in one particular geographical area or how, Fiona, how is that working? So, um, the, it's not it's not in one particular area for SAS. Um, for the the flow navigation centres that are that are within boards, not um, there's a flow navigation centre now within every board, but the arrangements are slightly different within them. As I say, it's part of this redesign of urgent care programme that's ongoing, and I think the evaluation of that is still ongoing as well. And I think it's due to report later this year. Okay, well, 
I'm quite sure we'd be interested in keeping a close eye on that to see. I think, Anthony, you want to come in on that point too? Anthony? Yeah, I was just going to make a more general point that the, the health department has been very focused on unscheduled care and unplanned care. Um, this is a very important strategic programme of work. This is one aspect of, of that work as well. And it also ties in, I think, with some of the primary care reform activity that's been going on across the health service for some time now. Um, and it's a question that we're going to be exploring, I think, in our future audit work on the NHS. And it may be an issue the committee wants to explore with the government if you invite them in for evidence. Thanks. I mean, what, and one of the other areas that's mentioned in your report is um, NHS 24 interventions. And so I guess, you know, by the same token, um, how effective have they been and are they revising the way that they work? Is there a, you know, is more investment going into that? Because we are uh, not least in the kind of uh, uh, COVID experienced environment we are now in, uh, the delivery of public services is being viewed slightly differently, isn't it? In light of what had to happen because of circumstance uh, over the course of the, the pandemic. So could you maybe um, enlighten us on the NHS 24 changes or interventions and how effective they have been? Yeah, I'll just, I think I might be showing again, Kevin, I absolutely agree that you know, we've all seen just how central NHS 24 has been, has become over the course of, of the past few years. Um, and it's really that, you know, we, we often use terms of in the NHS about kind of triage and, and pathways, but actually it's for really about getting patients you know, the right care that they need in, in the right place and supporting their understanding of where best to go and when. Um, but Fiona is, again, best place just to kind of talk the committee through that. Yeah, so the, the work happening with NHS 24 is at the heart of that programme I talked about, about the redesign of urgent care. So the, the stated aim of that is to help reduce um, the number of people who self-present to hospital as a first port of call by 15 to 20%. So the most up-to-date figures um, that I've seen from NHS 24 papers is that they think that compared to 2019, around 11 there's about 11 per cent reduction in that. But I say that it's a programme of work that's ongoing and has yet to report yet. So I would just a, a little bit of a general, um, a bit of caution around those figures until they, they are officially published. Um, I know um, you, when the winter pressures were at their greatest this the year, they. Um, or, la or towards the end of last year, there was an announcement made about additional funding to recruit more people to come to work with NHS 24 and an um, additional 200 people um, to help meet that increased demand on H NHS 24. And it does look like that's on target at the moment. Looking at the most up-to-date papers and um, board papers from NHS 24, it looks like um, they're going to actually surpass that target. Um, Thanks. Um, we're short of time, so I, but I think these are areas that we will want to return to as a committee. I think they're, uh, they're worthy of uh, further examination. But uh, t time is tight, so I'm going to ask uh, Willie Coffey to come in, who's got questions on um, the use of agency nursing and so on. Yeah. Willie. Thanks again, convener. Really, it's about staffing capacity and wellbeing issues, Auditor General. And you, your report uh, clearly tells us, again, that you know staff staff numbers are at a record high, everyone's at a record high, as you've said in the NHS, but we still face this this problem about workforce and recruitment and the the excessive course, let's say, of of employing bank and agency nursing staff. How do we resolve these two? What, what are your views and what the solution to that particular problem that may be? Yes you're right, uh, Mr Coffey. Our, our paper, as it has done in over many years, identifies just how pivotal NHS workers are to delivery of health services. Um, we reference that there is a new NHS workforce plan, but that the system remains under significant pressure in terms of um, well-being. You know, I think there, there, there's still emphasis from health professionals on that sense of burnout that um, NHS workers have experienced. Um, and in particular, kind of looking at the um, bank and agency costs, again, it's not a new issue. You know, I think this has been around for uh, for decades about having the right um, access from NHS boards to the skills that it needs at the right time. Um, bank and agency costs have, have increased. There's not enough people to, to fill the, uh, the nursing post. There have been some innovations, such as through kind of training places with uh, universities. And we know that the chief nursing officer is actively engaging with boards to try and come up with a, a longer-term solution. 
In terms of nursing in particular, um, a report also references that the reach of the NHS in Scotland um, has expanded internationally to try and access some of the additional skills um, to support um, services in Scotland. Um, they have considered an interesting um, value for money arrangements around this and taken a view that whilst there was a, an initial premium, the fact that the Scottish NHS hasn't paid for treatment arrangement, uh, training arrangements, I should say, um, offsets some of that cost. I think it's a sustainable model that's needed, Mr Coffey, in terms of the totality of a, a workforce plan that delivers for um, health and social care in Scotland. Banking agency is one part of that. I suspect there will always be a component of it, but it's the extent of reliance upon it that matters to be really tackled. I think um, my colleague Sharon Dowie may come in on their further recruitment and internationalisation in that aspect in a, a wee minute or two. But, uh, your report also talks about the wellbeing issue. Auditor General, you mentioned it there too. The, the report notes the government's view that there isn't a culture of seeking help in the health and social care sector. Could you say a, a wee bit more about that and uh, you know what role the, the National Wellbeing Hub is actually playing in that? Because that's a very important area because we know absence rates are particularly high. So could you say a little bit more about that to give us a flavour of the issue there? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Actually, I'll bring Fiona in again as well, who's also uh, looked at this part of it. Um, uh, like you, I was very kind of struck by that sense of um, resilience, robustness and, and the need for uh, NHS workers to seek help and support. I think uh, it cannot clearly be understated just the, the challenge, the trauma that they've experienced in dealing with COVID over the, the past few years. And therefore, not just for them as individuals, but really for their employer, to have appropriate arrangements and to support uh, people's health and well-being, um, and you know there are there are aspects of the way that the government is is approaching this. They talk about I think the phraseology they use is leading to change to build stronger, more effective arrangements to support their colleagues um, in accessing health and well-being support, but also building the right sustainable conditions that actually won't have NHS workers operating under periods of extreme pressure for, for prolonged uh, period. Fiona can say a bit more about kind of how that's uh, planning and any evaluation that the government's got planned. Hey, thanks, Auditor General. Um, I don't have an awful lot more to add other than what the Auditor General said there. It's just to say that when we had our case study interviews with boards, it came through loud and clear that staff wellbeing was of critical importance to them and that retention um, it's, it's crucial because you can recruit as many people as you like, but if you're not retaining them, then you're, you're on a hiding to nothing. So I think in um, paragraph 51, we talk about some of the steps that are being taken, and that's around um, putting in place the wellbeing coaches for staff and having people working within those teams then try to encourage that culture of speaking up when things aren't going well for you and just trying to promote that culture from within in terms of any evaluation of that programme though I don't have any extra information on that at the moment. Too early though to, to make any kind of guess as to whether these are being effective, these measures are effective in, in, in dealing with the whole well being issue and the absence rate issue, the high turnover issue. Is it too early to say that we're making an impact? I don't have enough evidence at the moment to say how well that's working. Um, so I think the the most the the next up-to-date data about um, staff absence and turnover, etc., won't be later until won't be available till later this year. So it'll be certainly worth looking at when that comes yeah, out. Absolutely, yeah. 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 That's right. I mean, there needs to be evidence and data led from that evaluation, but it's also the service that the um, the trade union and the representative bodies are undertaking, and they're pretty consistent, Mr. Coffey, about just the how their members are feeling the pressure, the, ex the extent of burnout. <laughs> the need for support, the need to ease that, that pressure. I and mean, even some of the examples we have in the report about um, nurses reporting only 37% reported able to take the breaks that they um, are expected to take just points to the ongoing challenge that, that they've been experiencing. Um, nobody wants to experience that in the workplace. Just, you know, and all, inevitably, that will have a flow-through impact in terms of absence rates, people deciding to make different career choices. Um, so it's a, you know, the well-being matters, but actually that's almost a re element of a reactive response. It's kind of think, well, how do you ease pressure in the system 
So the, and the other examples we've heard about NHS 24 and Scottish Ambulance Service are all components of it. But um, I think sometimes when, when Audit Scotland talks about a sustainable model, the, the inference is that it's just about a financial position. Actually, it's about sustainability across the piece mm -hmm. for patients, but, but also by, just as important for those that work in the NHS too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. That sounds like a clear area of focus that the committee might want to concentrate on as well in the future, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I just um, um, ask you about what, one of the, the, the most startling, I thought, figures in the report uh, that you're um, that you talking to this morning and we're asking questions about was, in paragraph 46, um, you talk about the um, extent to which um, bank nursing or nursing agency staff are now being called upon. And, I mean, I thought um, those figures were, uh, you know, very, very striking indeed. So you say, and this is just in the three um, health board areas that you've um, uh, looked at in a bit more depth, you say that the expenditure on uh, bank nursing is up by 57% in NHS Lothian. And in NHS, uh, NHS Highland, it increased by 90.5%. And in Ayrshire and Arran, it's up by even more than that, 90.8%. I mean, these are... Why on earth is that happening? So, colleagues can come in and give a bit more detail behind that, Kavina, but the numbers are startling in terms of the scale of change and call upon banking agency numbers. They're also not sustainable uh, in terms of delivering... Uh, Yes, from a financial perspective, but bear in mind that the, the consistency of care. So, you know, um, health workers talk about having that um, familiarity relationship with patients in their care. And if that's chopping and changing through, through different workers, all of that um, will inevitably impact upon outcomes. Some of this will be driven by um, inflationary pressures, cost of living, and just the availability of staff. I think particularly in some of the um, more rural areas, there will be a premium, and just the access to you know external factors beyond the control of the NHS. But affordable housing plays a, a key part in just the ability to recruit and retain permanent staff. If they're not available, therefore inevitably they lead to a call on banking agency uh, nurses to backfill for those vacancies. But in terms of the specifics behind the numbers, colleagues can elaborate. The only thing that I would add to that is if you look, those figures are from 2021-22. Uh, um, so I think the other thing impacting on that was obviously the effect of the pandemic and high levels of staff absence uh, leading to the need for um, bank and agency staff, as well as we, all the things we've talked about in terms of vacancy rates. OK, but I mean, obviously, again, from an audit point of view, the, the, these are people, uh, of course, we're talking about, but, they, but as a unit cost, the unit cost to the health service of agency staff is considerably more, isn't it, than the cost of a direct employee? Yes, it is. But you know, some of that is... is uh, it's not to say... And there's no value judgment for us about you know, agency workers relative to, to permanent staff. Um, but there is, a, from a cost perspective, yes, they will pay more... Employers, though, will, will, for periodic requirements, require that flexibility. So, you know, whether it's staff absence or a planned increase in capacity, it's the planned nature that, that matters most. If you're continually relying long-term banking agency, then you're suggesting both increased costs and not the provision of care that you would want through permanent employees. Yeah, and again, I think... Um as a committee, we'd uh, retain quite a, a strong interest in that and, and see what, where, where that goes this, uh, this next financial year. Um, again, I'm sh we're short of time, so I'm going to bring in Bill Kidd, who's got a, a number of questions that he wants to put. Bill. Yeah, um, thanks very much, convener. Uh, and thank you for everything uh, so far, because it's been extremely interesting. Um, and linked in with a number of the elements that you've been talking about, uh, obviously, is um, waiting times and waiting lists. Um, so exhibits four and five on pages 21 and 22 of the report show waiting times and waiting lists for planned care have increased and continue to grow, as has been said. Um, and 5,458 or 3.4% have been waiting more than a year for a diagnostic test or investigation. So the report refers to limited progress in tackling this backlog of care and the increase in waiting times and waiting lists 
Do you have any evidence of people starting to look beyond the NHS for their health care? Because I think we've all seen on television uh, people saying they're going to Eastern Europe or even further away, actually, for uh, to to you know get through more quickly. Um, I take your, your questions in reverse order for me. I don't think we've seen anything other than anecdotal evidence right. of. Uh, we've not gone looking for it. I should say as a uh, about people looking to exercise um, other options for for where they receive treatment. Um, the, the wider point about waiting lists and tackling the backlog is really kind of one of the central planks of, of today's report, actually, that um, as a result of many factors, people are still waiting longer than they would have done before the pandemic for treatment. We're calling for you know, real clarity. We've touched on it already this morning, Mr Kidd, about just the, across specialisms that people can have a clear expectation of how long they'll have to wait for treatment. There's been some aspects of progress, I should say, um, as well, I think, for especially for those that have been waiting longest for treatment, uh, patients waiting you know, two years and longer, they have become a priority for the NHS. So that aspect of uh, wait times is reducing. Um, unfortunately, though, for the NHS, that because of the way the performance indicators are constructed, that looks like a deterioration in performance because, if you're, because it's based around you know, a certain uh, number of weeks from treatment, if the NHS is focusing on those that have been waiting the longest, it doesn't tackle the, how that interacts with the, the performance indicator. So aspects, aspects of progress for the longest waits, but um, fundamentally from today's report from Audit Scotland is a call for real transparency mm -hmm. for patients across all specialisms of how long they'll have to wait and, if needs be, an update to that part of the recovery plan. Sure. Well, thank you. for. I mean, because um, uh, the waiting times for plans care vary significantly by speciality um, across and within the boards. Uh, is it been investigated or do you think there's any scope for more collaborative working across and within health boards uh, to reduce these waiting times? Is it possible that the health boards could cooperate because it's, um, it's longer waiting list in one than it is in another for certain, uh, certain treatments? If I, if I may start on this, actually, I'm going to bring Fiona in just to say about how that's uh, working at an individual board levels. One of the, the key planks of the government's plan to tackle waiting lists are the creation and expansion of the national treatment centres uh, to you know, boost capacity to tackle <coughs> many of the, uh, the waiting times. You know, we touched on it in a report, and it's been reported since, that you know, there are challenges in the delivery of some of the national waiting uh, national treatment centres, I should say, um, both in terms of cost growth and, and timing. Um, we're suggesting that, again, that there's kind of clear ongoing communication around the delivery of the treatment centres. Um, we touch on in today's report also that um, the national treatment centres are um, look to be geography blind, if I can use that expression, that they're a national resource. And that's, I think it's helpful that the government has clarified that, that it's not designed regardless of where they're positioned in the country, that patients from across Scotland have uh, uniform access to those services. But Fiona can come in and say a bit more, Mr Kidd, about the, how boards are working together. Yeah, in our case study interviews, we definitely found some good examples of boards working together locally, regionally and nationally to try and offer mutual aid and share good practice. Um, and as the Auditor General said, that the, one of the ideas between the, behind the, whole, the national treatment centres is that you shouldn't get these hot spots, that some of that capacity can be shared across the country, mm -hmm. so that hopefully areas where you have a particularly high waiting list that can be resolved more quickly, so that if you're, for example, in Glasgow, if you have a very, very high waiting list there and it's much lower elsewhere, you may be able to move people around a little bit if they're willing to travel. Um, so um, the Centre for Sustainable Delivery is... Um, a new um, unit that was set up um, late, um, earlier on, I think in 2021, and all of the boards mentioned to us the work that they are doing is helping them greatly to work together and share best practice and help to, to work together to, to reduce waiting lists. The other thing I would say as well is um, additional waiting list data has come out since we published, and it does show that for outpatients and inpatients, there's still an increase in that waiting list, although the rate of growth has been, like, begun to slow. 
Whereas for diagnostics, actually, for the first time in a long time, we've actually started to see the size of that waiting list, particularly for radiology, start to decrease, decrease slightly. So the only thing I would say that would temper that slightly is with the winter pressures, mm -hmm. with some boards having to pause some of their elective and planned care again. We're not sure what impact that might have when we see the figures for the next quarter. Sure. OK, well, thank you for that. That's, that's uh, got interesting points there. Um, now... To go for a minor tangent, but it's still linked. Um, patients, obviously, when they um, are removed from the waiting list, when they've attended their appointment, are been admitted for treatment, so obviously they're not on the list anymore. Um, but, well, if the treatment is no longer required for patients for whatever reason, um, you'd imagine that they're, in, uh, they're not on the list anymore, or hopefully. Um, is there any data for the number of patients removed from waiting lists due to no longer requiring treatment? I mean, is there any trends that can be identified there? So, yes, some data does exist um, about um, patient no longer required treatment. I don't have a further breakdown within that to say what the particular reasons are within that. So there could be a number of reasons they decide not to go ahead with it or they, for example, decide to go down the private health care route. So... Um, I haven't, um, ha to be honest, haven't looked at those trends in any great detail. There was nothing hugely that jumped out to me when I looked at it. Yeah. Um, but data does exist on that, yeah. That is right. OK, thank you very much for that. And um, The impact of increased waiting times on people's physical and mental well-being um, can be highlighted in evidence that patients are presenting for care in a worse condition than prior to the pandemic. Um, the report states that no lo that longer waiting times are impacting in wait patients and people's uh, health and well-being with patients presenting for care in a frailer and more acute condition and with more complex needs. Are there assessments being made of the impact of current, on current waiting times on health and well-being of the patient prior to their uh, the attendance as in hospital or whatever? It's not a question that we we talked specifically about that that assessment. Um, but what I can say is that from our, our case study interviews, they all said without a doubt that they were seeing cases of people presenting in a much frailer um, condition than before the pandemic. We also had a good conversation with them versus arthritis, um, particularly around some of the patients they are supporting as well. And they definitely said they were seeing an impact on the weight length on people in terms of their independence and their pain levels and their right. physical and mental health. Right. And there are figures then being produced on that? Then, so there is information um, from a survey that um, Versus Arthritis did back in um, 2020. Um, I don't have those particular figures with me today, but it did show um, um, most respondents um, saying they had increased levels of pain, reduced mobility, independence and deterioration in physical and mental health while waiting for treatment. And there are, there are some figures around that, yeah. That's no, really helpful. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Fabiana, yes, of course. Nice to, to, to Fiona's point, I, I, I didn't want to recommend. I think we also touched on the report some of the um, excess death analysis um, as a result um, of the pandemic. And just to draw that conclusion, the national data is inconclusive in terms of whether excess wait times are a key contributor to um, uh, to, to wait times are contributed to excess deaths at this stage. What we've also seen, though, is the, the government, I, th I think, being clear with people about some of the things to look out for, that the NHS is open, in spite of you know, the circumstances did arise over the course of you know, winter pressures, where, where some urgent um, situations resulted in delays to um, planned treatment. But the totality of the message is that the NHS is open if you have conditions or symptoms to seek treatment, and that um, rather than referencing back to where we were two plus years ago about uh, kind of easing off access of services. Thank you. Thank you. That's a public information announcement by the <laughs> Auditor General. <laughs> Excellent. Um, um, Craig, I think Craig, how you want you to come in uh, on this area? Um, just, just very uh, briefly, yeah. convenient. Um, Mr. Paul, you, um, I think uh, Mr. Hickman made reference to uh, the, the private sector and the anecdotal evidence that you suggested. And obviously, I think a BBC disclosure programme. 
and again it was a survey so we can't necessarily put a lot of store on it but found that one in five people on NHS waiting lists had uh, had some contact with the private sector uh, over the last 12 months I think that, that was something broadly of, of that order um, is, 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 the, is, is it worth interrogating perhaps the, um, the, the, the size and the use of the private sector at the moment because wouldn't that obviously have uh, a read through in relation to some of the pressures that we see within the NHS. I'm thinking particularly, and again anecdotally, but in relation to my post back and probably colleague, colleagues' post back, treatment, for example, of orthopaedics or um, uh, treatment for cataracts, early stage cataracts. Many people, when they have their first uh, clinical appointment, are effectively being told, despite the fact that you're saying the NHS is open, that it will take three to five years for that treatment, and they're automatically pivoting to the private sector if they can afford it, which obviously undermines fundamental principles of the NHS. But I'm just concerned that you may see sta staff drifting towards the private sector if there is a growth in those specialisms and people are electing to do that. And whilst it may bring down waiting lists in some senses, it also means that those with the means to do it or the borrowing capacity to do it will be accessing health care far, qu far quicker and therefore not reaching the same levels of acuity uh, for those who wouldn't necessarily be able to do it. So is it worth in terms of taking stock of the private sector if there has been some shift? Because it will, it will undoubtedly at some point have an, an issue in relation to NHS capacity, both workforce and uh, waiting list capacity. I, th I think I'll think carefully about that, actually, about how that, what that means for our work. Um, and I guess the boundaries of my yeah, responsibilities so that, as it relates to uh, public spending. Um, yes, we are interested in kind of the use of health services, whether it's the growth of national treatment centres or the extent to which alternative arrangements from the NHS leads back through itself accessing uh, private providers to tackle, as it has done in the past, to tackle yeah. um, to, uh, waiting times. Um, like you, Mr Hoyle, I've only anecdotal evidence yeah. um, at the moment that people are exercising this choice. Um, we'll keep an eye on it. I think it's probably as much as I could say through surveys, analysis, data, um, and um, perhaps most pertinently that Fiona suggested about you know, if that's leading to any in tangible, noticeable change in patterns about the size of waiting list. Mm. If there's a discernible judgment that we can reach from that. Um, we'll, we'll build that into our thinking, probably as much as I would say at the moment, yeah. for next year's overview report. Thanks. Thank you. We've mentioned a few times this morning the National Treatment Centres, which are in part a National Health Service response to some of these pressures um, uh, in place of the private sector, I, I guess. I mean, we know that there were three uh, National Treatment Centres scheduled to open up last year, uh, and they didn't. And I think the last I saw, they were scheduled to open up in the first half of this year. Um, I think rumour has it the First Minister in one of her final acts may be opening one up uh, before the end of this week. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. Uh, my, my serious point is there have been delays. Uh, I mean, can you um, elaborate for us your understanding of the reason why uh, there was a delay in the opening of these treatment centres? Because that has contributed too, hasn't it? The pressures that we've been talking about for the last... Um, hour and, and 20 minutes and do you have any updates uh, that you could give us uh, as to whether they are on schedule uh, to be opened up uh, during the course of this year? Yeah, I'll, I'll bring Lee in, convener, to, to share what we, what we have. I think some of the announcement of delays uh, was made after our publication of our work, actually, so there's perhaps just um, a bit of an overlap there. Before passing to Lee, most important thing I would say, just how important the national treatment centres are to building the capacity. Ten of them are planned um, across Scotland to you know, 40,000 procedures by 2028. Um, we know that there are all those delays that will push likely some of the uh, required capacity towards the end of this decade. I'm not sure if I've got the detail to be more specific that, but I'll turn to colleagues if, to, if we can update the committee as best we can. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, I, convener, as far as we're aware, the, the three that are due to open are well open at, at, over the next couple of months. Um, that's the latest information that we have. In terms of the delays, I think there's been a number of factors at play. Um, obviously, you know, some of them were already in train in the, it, when the pandemic hit. Um, I think there's also been issues around, obviously, 
that other um, sectors are being impacted in terms of availability of both construction materials but also the cost of construction. Um, and I think another challenge as well is obviously staffing those new centres as well and making sure um, that the, the staff needed are in place um, because there are um, key staff that are needed for those centres that are notoriously difficult uh, to recruit anyway, for example, theatre nurses and anaesthetists. Um, so again, it's just a combination of factors, I think, that have led to those delays. But as far as we're aware, the three of those will be opening in the next couple of months. Thank you. And again, that's something else we'll add to our list of uh, watching briefs that I think we will need to keep an eye on as a committee. Um, uh, I've just got uh, really one more question before I, uh, we, we draw to a close and bring, I bring in Sharon Dowie and, and, and Bill Kidd and Willie Coffey for uh, one last go each. What, what, um, what I was interested just to tease out was, so I know that in July 2022 it was announced uh, that there would be new national planned care treatment targets and um, as I understand it the deadline for some of these targets has already passed with them not being met I mean do, are you aware of uh, the targets uh, now being reviewed and do you know what the new targets and time skills are going to be yeah, I think Fiona has that detail can Fiona can bring it in okay so I, I wasn't aware of any of those targets being reviewed or revised. Um, so you're right in saying some of those deadlines has passed and well, substantial progress has been made in reducing some long waits. It does look like the targets, depending how you define the target, has not been hit. Um, so um, I'd be very interested to see if they're planning to, re to revise those targets and particularly in light of some of the pauses in elective care that we saw at the start of the year. Right, that's fine. And, and again, uh, th these are issues I'm sure we will return to in subsequent uh, uh, sessions to talk about the, the NHS. Um, uh, Sharon Dowie's got a final question to put from her before, as I say, I invite Bill and Willie to come in. Sharon. Thank you. Um, the report highlights workforce capacity as the biggest risk for recovery and shows that one key recruitment target of increasing the GP workforce by 800 is not on track to be achieved by the deadline of 2027. What is the Scottish Government doing to address this? And in your view, is this target still achievable? Um, at, a, at a high level, absolutely right, Deputy Convener. We're saying that a sustainable workforce um, is such a fundamental to delivering the recovery of the NHS and a sustainable service going forward. I'm, I'll bring Lee in in a second, actually, just to update on, on the, the GP um, delivery target. What we've said in, in today's report and really kind of raising a red flag that progress towards the delivery of 800 GP targets is at risk. Um, that the government's plans, the steps that they need to take are fundamental and it relates back to really that shifting the balance of care from an acute setting into primary care and a, a preventative context. Before passing to Lee, I think one of the things, and I'm happy to see more to the committee next week, we're giving a bit of thought to future audit work in this area and potentially doing um, some audit work on primary care services that we can track and report further on the progress towards this aspect um, of workforce in terms of GP numbers. But Lee can say a bit more about what the way that's looking like at the moment. Thank you, Mr General. Um, in terms of what the uh, Scottish Government, I think they're trying to increase training places to encourage people to pursue um, a, a career um, in general practice. Um, it is a challenging target, though. There's no getting away from that. Um, and I think there's a range of other things um, that they're also focused on in terms of uh, retention of our GPs. Our GPs are also uh, very, very stressed and burnt out following the pandemic. There's huge demand on them. Um, so it's about how we retain the GPs that we currently have as well. Um, and there's a number of reforms um, currently uh, in progress. Uh, one of the main things being the multidisciplinary teams uh, to try and reduce the workload um, on some of our general practitioners. Um, but as I said, it, it is a challenging target. And our, as our report says, we don't think it's currently on track. Thanks. Is there enough conversations between the government departments when they make these announcements? So the likes of we've announced that there's 800, we're going to be 800 extra GPs, but are they actually then speaking to universities? Are they giving them the funding? Because we hear that Scottish universities 
are limiting the number of Scottish students that can go in because they need fee-paying students to go in to pay the cost. So is there enough funding being given for these places? Because I've, I've, when you spoke about the primary care workers as well, they're obviously trying to put more pharmacists in to help GPs and take off the workload. But then I'll hear stories about the pharmacists go in, the GPs then reduce the number of hours that they're working because they are burnt out. So it's not actually helping, but there's also an issue with the workforce planning as well for the pharmacists. So is there enough funding being given to the universities to make sure that we can actually get Scottish students places? We didn't, we didn't look at the funding um, in any detail in terms of what's being given to We didn't find any evidence that the universities uh, can't, don't have the capacity to offer uh, the additional training places um, that the Scottish Government are planning. Um, I think one of, the other thing, one of the things we have come across that we, we outline in our report is there are pressures on supervision. Um, because obviously when the trainees come through and go into general practice, they do need to be supervised for a period of time. Um, and we are aware that there is some pressure on the number of GPs, for example, that are allowed to supervise trainees. Um, and NHS Education Scotland are obviously looking into how they can improve that situation and address that, that pressure. Uh, but we didn't look at um, the funding in any detail. OK, thanks. Of course, yes. Yeah, just very briefly. I think it is part of the plan. I think that's you know, in terms of the um, not just a, a notional target of 800. You know, clearly there has to be people who are brought into those roles, and that is absolutely part of the, you know, the funding through um, university. Not just for GPs, actually, but I think our, our report also talks about uh, funding for nursing vacancies and the role and the work that they're doing with universities and colleges uh, to support that. The other organisation that's got a key part to play this is NHS Education for Scotland NES and, and their role in supporting um, trainee doctors through to um, qualification and practising. So it comes by, brings us back to there needs to be a, a coordinated, detailed plan to deliver um, on these targets. That will be the route through to tackling some of the challenges that are set out in today's report. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Bill. Bill Kidd. Bill. Thank you, Convener. Um, following on uh, in terms of recruitment, um, in the report, uh, paragraph 111 and page 37, um, the Scottish Government's short to medium term strategy is investigated in mitigating the domestic supply of staff uh, with international recruitment and a million pounds been provided to each board to help identify international staff who can complete the training, etc. Um, now, you've, you've targeted three boards, and each of those uh, does show have recruited internationally. It also, though, notes that NHS Highland found the process time-consuming and expensive. Um, so, can I ask if this is, represents a suitable option for future um, uh, NHS workforce growth? I, I don't think we've reached a view on whether it's... Um, a suitable or, or best option. I think it's likely to be a question that the NHS can, can best explore what their longer term strategy is. It feels like it's an part of um, a number of steps, a number of tools that they have at their disposal to right. tackle a short term issue. Um, and you can see that you know, there are some aspects of progress, some successes in it. The cost benefit of going down this road relative to recruiting and training uh, domestic um, workforce supply all needs to be evaluated. Uh, I think it's one of many aspects, but it, it shouldn't be seen as you know, a very clear direct alternative yeah. to you know, longer term training as part of a coordinated workforce plan. So does that essentially mean then that it's, it's, um, you can't do just one or the other? You have to actually build it as a, as a programme forward then? Yeah, yeah I think it, my sense would only be a, likely, but a small component of recruitment into right. the NHS, a necessary reactive step to bring in capacity when it was most needed during the pandemic and, and the aftermath that we're now in, um, it doesn't feel like it's an, a long-term um, kind of key uh, plan of workforce planning for the NHS. I should say, Mr. Kerr, we've not done any you know, yeah. detailed work on this um, yet, um, but it feels like our, our interest would be in a much wider evaluation of how NHS workforce is operating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, the final question in this morning's session goes to Willie Coffey. Willie. Well, thanks again, Convener Rod. General, one of the 
huge issues that we've seen over the years, and it dates back to Bob Black's time, uh, was about how the, the government, the NHS, engages with the public mm. in the reform process, the journey of reform and how we engage and get the support of the wider public. Now, I was visiting one of my own GP practices in Kilmarnock recently, and there was about 20 or so GPs that spared some time to talk to me about this issue. And they, they're, they're concerned, they're disappointed that the public perception of them is that they're not working for them and willing to see them. And that's a big issue. All the members have heard this right throughout the Parliament, but it's not true. GPs are delivering these services, are engaging with the public face to face. But the public perception issue is a big issue for us. Um, could you offer any advice in, to the committee about how the government uh, could revisit this problem and have a closer engagement with the public to allow them to make this journey of reforms along with us? Yeah, it's a very interesting example, Mr Coffey, actually. Um, like you know, uh, my predecessors, Bob Black, Carolyn Gardner and myself, I think we've all said about the sustainability of the NHS in Scotland needs detailed evaluation and engagement with um, you know, decision makers, parliamentarians such as yourselves, people that work in the NHS, but most fundamentally people that use the service, patients. That's not, all, not yet happened in a really detailed national conversation about the sustainability of health and social care services. Um, not just us, many people have said about really we're not in a place that we have a sustainable model that can work for all of us in terms of what it costs, recruiting people to work in health and social care and delivering long-term preventative better outcomes for the people of Scotland. We have to do that. We have to engage the public about their expectations and what's achievable. Um, it's a key part of today's report, one of our recommendations, Mr Coffey, that that step now needs to happen. That might be challenging, might involve some uh, changes to really deeply held convictions about health and social care operates in Scotland. But I think we only need to look at what we're experiencing you know, over the past few years about a system that feels fragile, layering that some of the views of um, you know, fiscal experts and the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission that if we continue on the path without making some of these reforms, it will require very unpalatable choices about prioritisation. You know, so just the affordability, if we continue to invest in health and social care services in the way that we're doing, it will mean that we won't be able to afford other key parts of, of public services. All of that requires a detailed, structured conversation, but fundamentally with the public so that they can have their voice heard and what matters to them. Have, have you views on how we should deliver that? What kind of participation processes should we try to to create, to promote, to really and truly engage the public in this reform process that, that, that we all know is needed. How do we go about yeah. it? Saying it's needed is, is great, but how do we deliver it? Have you any suggestions that you could offer us? So you're right, it's easy to say it, actually. But, 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 and I'll probably um, reserve a chance to comment on that, because I think it's, a, it's primarily, firstly, a question for you know, government and the NHS, do they agree? That that's um, what's necessary and moving into and how best to do that. I think it's also a role for the Parliament officially and, and, you know, and thinking about how we are uh, measuring the performance of the NHS in Scotland about um, do the performance indicators that we currently use on and report so regularly, are they giving a good enough uh, story about how healthy Scotland is as a country? I think that's equally part of it uh, too, Mr Coffey, but how we best go about that, I think there are people better placed than I to say that you know, the most effective way of public engagement. That's clear from our report is that that needs to happen next. Okay. Thank you very much for that really important point again. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And I, I guess my take from that is that uh, we can't rely on a top-down solution. It, there needs to be a, a proper participatory engagement of uh, people if there is going to be uh, any uh, faith placed in any reforms that take place. So, uh, look, I, I want to really uh, thank you so much for the evidence that you've given to us this morning. Uh, as I said at the start, it was an impactful report when it was published, and I think it will continue to uh, resonate and certainly give us as a committee uh, quite a number of areas that we will want to pursue to... Um, 
you know, to, to get to uh, where we think uh, public interest needs to get to on uh, where these reforms are, what's happening with the money that's going into the NHS uh, and whether the outcomes are being delivered. And if they are not, why not and what can be done to fix that? So um, I'm going to um, uh, thank you very much for your uh, contributions this morning. Thank the committee for their uh, questioning and I'm going to move the meeting into uh, private session.